When I signed up for BT Broadband, I was sent one of these, a BT Home Hub 5. But is it actually a network hub? Is this Sky Hub actually a hub? Well, there aren't hubs at all. Hubs have been pretty much obsolete for years. And if you saw the first of my networking videos, a hub's just a multi-port repeater. It just receives data frames and sends them out to the other ports. So what are these things exactly? Okay, so they aren't hubs, but on all of these, you can see four Ethernet ports on the back. It turns out that all of these devices do indeed contain switches. Network switches, look at the MAC address, check them against the table that matches MAC addresses to ports, and they use that information to send packets to the correct device. In fact, I take these to schools and students use them as four port switches to build small star networks. However, there is more tech in these boxes than just the network switch. The noticeable aerials on some of these are a clue to their ability to handle some kind of wireless connection. In my first video, we looked at wired networks and their history. But what about wireless? What is it? And where did this technology come from? Well, I can remember my nan talking about the wireless, and she was referring to the radio. Now, radio waves were first discovered in 1886 by the German scientist Heinrich Rudolf Hertz. And it was a revolutionary discovery because in those days, sending long distance electronic messages required telegraph wires stretched across the country, held up by telegraph poles. To send a long distance electronic message or telegram, you'd convert your message to Morse code and tap out the codes on a Morse key. And the telegraph wires would carry the signals to another geographical location where the signal could be received and converted back into written text. The problem was that the cable was expensive and you couldn't communicate with anyone unless you had a wired link. The introduction of radio waves meant that telegrams could be sent through the airwaves. This technology was famously used in 1912 on the passenger ship Titanic. So passengers could send messages ashore or get news updates. Apparently there was a telegram message warning about icebergs, but they ignored that to their peril. When the ship began sinking, the wireless telegram system was used to send information to nearby ships and shore stations to list information of survivors. In Britain, just before the First World War, this technology was developed further by the General Post Office and was used extensively for telegrams. The technology developed significantly during the war to pass on orders and communications between armies and navies. After the war, a company called the British Broadcasting Corporation, or BBC, took over and in the UK, people started to get radio broadcasts of news and also entertainment. Eventually, several frequencies were used to transmit multiple channels of content. The radio frequencies are measured in Hertz, after Heinrich Hertz. You can still receive traditional broadcast channels on FM radio. This always seems... The BBC broadcasts modern music, Radio 1, in the range 97 to 99 megahertz. Radio 2 for the oldies, 88 to 91 megahertz. Radio 3 for classical and jazz between 90 and 93 megahertz. And Radio 4 for drama and philosophy, 92 to 95 megahertz. If you wanted to do more than just listen to the radio, you could get your own transceiver and talk to your friends with a walkie-talkie. Although these were developed during the Second World War, they became popular in the 1980s for recreational use. If you watch the TV show Stranger Things, you'll have seen the kids with these handsets. The pair of handsets that I've got here are locked onto a specific frequency. But if lots of other people nearby had them, your conversations would get interrupted by strangers transmitting on the same frequency. 
And you obviously couldn't talk to your friends on the same frequency as the police or other emergency services. What you need then is a set which allowed you to change channel. Then you could talk to your friends while other nearby radio users could hold their conversations on a different channel. Wouldn't it be great if you could send and receive computer data over the airwaves like this? Well, that's what happened at the end of the 1990s. Wi-Fi was introduced for local area networking and has now become more common than wired connections. Your computer still needs a network interface controller with its own physical address or MAC address, but it needs to be able to send and receive the Ethernet frames wirelessly. Just like their wired counterparts, these wireless network interface controllers, or WNICs, are now built into your laptop, tablet, or smartphone. If, like on most desktops, it isn't built into your machine, you can get one of these inexpensive USB wireless adapters. You'll end up with two MAC addresses, one for your wired connection and one for the wireless adapter. To connect to your existing wired LAN, there would need to be a wireless access point. This one is an enterprise quality device which can provide a strong signal and it gets its power over the Ethernet cable. You could connect to an available port on your switch and then you can connect without being plugged in. Nowadays you can pick up Wi-Fi signals all over the place. Hotels, airports, pubs and restaurants will mostly have at least one wireless access point like this. So, have these things got wireless access points inside them? Yes. Amongst other things, there is a small wireless access point inside. But these are low power and only suitable for small areas. They might not even cover your entire house, so you might need a Wi-Fi extender to repeat the signal to some rooms. Unless your house is some distance from your neighbour, it's likely that your Wi-Fi signal is competing with the signal from your neighbours. Just like with the walkie-talkies, you can have problems with interference if other people's wireless access points are operating on the same frequency. With all of these running in close proximity, let's have a look at a scan of the airwaves. You can identify them by their MAC addresses, or their service set IDs, SSID for short. Once again, the frequencies are measured in hertz and are split into channels. But the frequency is much higher than the radio frequencies that I mentioned earlier. These are all around 2.4 gigahertz. And the 14 frequencies used are called channels 1 to 14. Looking at my scans again, there are clearly some overlaps which will cause interference. This can be solved by changing to the least busy channel. Here it might be best to change the Sky Hub from 12 to 5. This can be done by logging in to the web interface and selecting another channel. Most of these can be set to automatically switch to the least busy frequency channel. Wireless has become extremely popular because setting up a wireless LAN is so easy. No difficult cabling to run around your house and the fact that you can wander around your building without plugging in is just what you need for mobile devices such as laptops, tablets and smartphones. Although this is convenient for short distances, it can be problematic through thick walls. And there's that interference if your neighbours are on exactly the same frequency. Other issues come from the fact that people outside of your property could connect to your network if your Wi-Fi password is weak or if it's secured using an old protocol. Anyone connected to your network could intercept data packets, so encryption becomes even more important. All of these devices are using a security protocol called Wi-Fi Protected Access 2, or WPA2. This uses an encryption device that encrypts the network with a 256-bit key. Unfortunately, Weaknesses in various wireless encryption systems have been exploited over time and new encryption standards need to be introduced when this happens. Okay, so what we've got here is a wireless access point combined with a switch, but the other trick that these 
have up their sleeve is the ability to connect to other networks via your phone line. We call that internetworking. That's the thing about a LAN, it's local, confined to your house or a building or a site such as a school. But once you connect further afield, your network will become part of a wide area network or WAN. A network can be referred to as a WAN if it extends over a wide geographical area. For instance, a company with premises in five different cities might have a LAN at each location and then connect them together. This could be done by renting a lease line from a telecommunications company or even laying huge amounts of fibre optic cable. They could even use satellite links to bridge really long distances. Of course, most people with one of these aren't interested in basic wide area networking. They want to connect up to the biggest one of all, the internet. The internet is a worldwide collection of computer networks. The development of the internet started in the late 1960s with a few American universities, research and defence sites. And at that time it was known as ARPANET. By the early 70s, this network had 20 nodes spread across the US. But in 1973, the first non-US link was made via satellite connection to Europe. And this international network looked like this. London's just here. The idea was for a data packet to travel across the network by passing it from one network node to another until it gets to its destination. Each transfer from one node to another is called a hop. If someone using a computer at the University College London wanted to send some data to Stanford University in Silicon Valley, there were multiple routes along which the data could travel. For example, the packet could hop from London to Norsar, then hop via satellite link to the east coast of the United States of America, from here, the data packet could hop along the northern nodes via MITS and the University of Utah. But it could take a totally different route. It could, for example, go south through ARPA onto the Air Force Weapons Laboratory and then continue hopping north along the nodes on the west coast. This added some resilience to the network because if links were down for a while, alternate routes could be used. This system of sending packets through a network using potentially different routes is called packet switching. When lots of data needs to be transmitted, the data would be chopped into multiple packets and those packets could travel across the network via multiple routes. Packet switching is commonly implemented using a protocol known as the Internet Protocol and it uses an Internet Protocol address known as an IP address. The IP address is used to help work out which route to send the packets along. In the packet switching part of my networking workshop, we look at what happens when you request a web page from a web server. It's enlightening to examine the contents of the packet. You can see the individual bytes of data in the packet. For instance, you've got the MAC addresses, which are needed by the network interface cards and the network switches. You've got the IP addresses, which are used by the routers to work out which way to direct the packets. There are HTTP headers and the payload, which is the HTML of the web page itself. The topology of this type of network is called a partial mesh topology. You've got multiple connections between different network nodes. This means that most devices can send data in multiple directions. But some devices aren't connected directly, so data has to be sent via other devices on the network. If every node was connected to every other node, then you wouldn't need to pass data packets through other nodes. That would be called a full mesh topology. This would be difficult to implement as a wired network, because every time you add a new node to a full mesh, you need new links to all the other nodes. At each node of the internet, there is a device which reads the IP address of each packet and uses that to work out the ideal route to send it along in order to get to its destination efficiently while also avoiding congestion. These devices are called routers. 
They're a step up from a switch because they can use the IP address in a packet to perform traffic directing functions to forward packets onto the next best router in the partial mesh network. Routers make these decisions using a protocol called TCP IP. The internet has grown significantly since its infancy and there are now billions of internet connected devices all over the world. In the UK we've got many more than that solitary connection in 1970s London. The internet in the UK looks like this now with seabed cable connections and comprehensive use of telephone exchanges. So coming back to these devices the inclusion of this connector which can hook your LAN up to the internet is the reason that we actually call these things routers. It's a very simple form of routing but still if the data packet is for the local machine it forwards it onto the LAN but if the packet has a global IP address it will route it onto the internet. There are so many things involved in making sure that your data arrives successfully when you send it over the internet. Thinking about it on one level you've just got pieces of hardware sending binary ons and offs to the next device via some kind of cabled or wireless link. But if you look at that same process on another level you've got a huge number of packets of data being routed around the internet. On another level you might be considering the actual payload inside of the data transmissions. For example a web server sending a, a web page to the browser on your laptop. To break up these complex ideas into manageable pieces computer scientists refer to a layered model. The two most commonly used models are the TCP IP model and the OSI 7 layer model. People looking at the physical layer of the model are concerned solely by issues such as the transmission media, coaxial, cat5 twisted pair, fiber optic or some kind of radio frequency, the connectors and the network interface controllers. In the next layer, the link or data link layer, the focus might be about using MAC addresses in a switch to select the correct wire to send the data along. The internet or network layer would consider the routing of packets which have been labelled with IP addresses using the internet protocol. The transport layer is about chopping up a big piece of data into packets, putting them into a sequence order and checking that they were all sent, delivered and reassembled correctly. It will also use a port number to identify what type of application the packet is for. For instance, email traffic would be assigned to port 25, 110 or 143 but web pages would use port 80 or 443 and FTP file transfers use ports 20 and 21. These port numbers indicate the protocols that are needed from the application layer. For browsing the internet this would involve your desired page being requested using HTTP and then the web server at the other end getting the HTML for the requested page and sending it back. If the application was email then we might be concerned with POP3 mailboxes. We'll have a detailed look at these applications of the internet and the protocols that go with them in my next video, Networking Part 3.